So you want to buy a cheap flood car, and it could actually be a great idea. Once water enters the cabin of an insured car, most agencies will total the car immediately, no matter what's wrong with it. But before you buy, there's three questions you should ask. How much, how long, and what type? How much refers to how much water got in the car. Sometimes there's a water line that is marked on the sides of these cars to show you how high the waters actually rose. How long refers to how long that water sat in the car and what type refers to what type of water flooded the car. The answer to these three questions will almost guarantee whether you're getting a car that you can resurrect or whether it should stay a write-off. The truth is that most people figure out the answer to these questions after buying a flood car and sometimes we find out that the answers to these questions aren't so straightforward. And that was definitely the case with this Dodge Viper. At first, we thought that the water was salt water because of the sand saturated engine bay. Later, we learned that this car was involved in an accident where it hit a fire hydrant and landed in a dry patch of land that was now flooded with hydrant water, which broke open a sinkhole large enough to consume the front half of the Viper. So now I'm wondering, was the water we pulled out of the engine here just fresh hydrant water? Or could it have mixed with water from the Gulf to be brackish? Well, we'll find out the answer to that shortly. Either way, this car really only needs four things to run. Fuel, spark compression, and a miracle. And what might be most interesting is the comments from all of you. It seems the audience is really torn on this, as half of you seem to think all the preparation we're doing to try and get this engine started is a total waste of time, and the other half of you think that we're gonna be able to get this running with little to no issue. Now, if a competent engine builder tears down this V10 Viper engine and rebuilds every item that might've been affected by the flood, we already know the likely outcome. But if a shade tree pours cola down the cylinders in hopes it will break down the rust, build up, well, you know, that makes this gamble way more of an actual gamble. Our goal here is to get this engine running using DIY methods that anyone can do without pulling the engine out of the car. Now, if you've been following along, you already know that first we drained the oil pan, then we pumped all the water that was in the spark plug holes out. We replaced the oil and water mixture in the crankcase with diesel and kerosene, which are really good cleaners, and we've let it sit now for over a week so it can break down any contaminants left in the engine. And in just a moment, we'll be draining all this out and filling up the crankcase back with oil. In the cylinders, we tested out a number of different solutions to see which would work best to break down the rust buildup. The rust removing agent that worked best was then used in all 10 cylinders and left for three days. The transformation here was pretty drastic and the cylinders look much cleaner. Now remember when we poured our rust treatment down the cylinders, it was clear and it had the consistency of water. And look at it now, this is just a few cylinders worth of the treatment and it's really done a good job breaking down and trapping all those rust particles. This might have been a pretty unconventional use of this product, but in our specific case, it seemed to work out perfect. And when we first got power to the Viper, I noticed the fuel gauge was all the way on full, which made me a little suspect that maybe there wasn't just gas in this tank, but this was well before I saw that viral TikTok video. If you look at the way the car cars angled in the sinkhole and you consider the location of the fuel tank in the Viper which is right about here. It's above the rear axle below the convertible top. It's pretty likely that maybe it just did have a full tank but to be sure I went and stuck a hose all the way down as far as I could in the fuel tank from the top and I siphoned out a few gallons. Now when water and gasoline mix you can tell it does separate almost similar to the water that we got out of our oil pan. So it came out of this tank seemed to be straight gas and it never happens like that where you pick up an auction car with a full tank. We just hit the jackpot especially when you consider current day gas prices and since that is such a hot topic right now. Let me show you guys a quick hack that I've been using the last few years to assure I'm getting the best price when I fill up. As long as I can remember it being available well before I was making videos on here, I always use this app called Get Upside to track the price at my local gas station to make sure I'm getting the best deal when I'm filling up. And to this day, I still use Get Upside because it goes one step further. Now current day around here, the price of regular fuel is around like 380 to four bucks a gallon. But watch this, when I pop open the Get Upside app and I look at local stations around me. They've got three that are just in a few mile radius. But with their cash back, they're showing me that this racetrack has the best price at $3.49 a gallon. But just popping open the app and claiming the offer, I'm gonna say 42 cents a gallon, which adds up huge when you're filling up a big truck like this. It's not just for gas, Get Upside also allows you to earn cash back at grocery stores and restaurants. Look at this, Culver's is on their list and I can get 7% cash back when I eat there, which is at least a few times a month. I just 
just hit claim offer and watch the cash back roll in. And when it's time to cash out, it's really simple and you can literally get cash straight to your bank account or PayPal, or you can choose a gift card at really useful places like Amazon and Walmart. So make sure you get Upside totally free using my link down in the description. Oh, and don't forget during sign up, make sure you use my name, Sam Crack. That's gonna get you a $5 or more cash back bonus on the first $10 you spend. Check out Get Upside at the link in the description and start enjoying that sweet cash back today. Dude, it looks it looks mostly like diesel fuel. I think it looks mostly like diesel fuel. We can reuse that in the tractor, no problem. Oh yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, it's mostly oil, dude. Oh, look at that. Mostly oil. That's really good. Now with all the diesel fuel out of the engine, we're able to get a good look at what the lower portion of our engine looks like via the scope camera here. And right when we run it in, we see the pickup tube. And look how clean it is. I'm really surprised there's no corrosion, no buildup around it at all. I mean, it looks perfect. It looks like it wasn't involved in the flood. If you look in the far distance at a few of these angles here, you're going to see a little bit of maybe corrosion or buildup. And it doesn't look too abnormal, at least to me. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. When you consider that five gallons of water came out of this car before any oil came out. I mean, it's really amazing to see how clean everything is here. Here's some of the bearing caps, and obviously our main concern here is probably the bearings themselves, which we're not able to see unless we start disassembling things. I mean, it gives me a lot of hope that this engine is going to spin and spin freely, and hopefully we'll find out here in a second. But maybe it's because this engine was so saturated with our water, with our oil, that there wasn't a lot of room for air to get in and start the corrosion process in here and it kind of kept it good that's just my theory again let me know your thoughts in the comments but overall i think this all looks really awesome i don't think it needs any further treatment so it can get in there lubricate everything properly and do its job when we start to spin things over clearly the theme with this flooded engine is cleanliness at all times inside we want anything that's trapped left in here out of the engine that's why we let things sit like the diesel fuel in the crankcase that's why we let that rust inhibitor product sit in the cylinder and just kind of break everything down and the first time we spin it over it's going to be circulating anything that's left in there and hopefully we can rely on our oil filter to trap that stuff and we're going to want to go through a few oil filters while we're cycling oil through the car to really make sure it's clean for the first time we run the car so i went and bought a bunch from and being that this is a viper mopar oil filters are pretty costly but i showed you guys during the aston martin build i shop rock auto and i buy these clearance oil filters these were like a buck 25 a piece they fit the dodge viper and while a lot of people weren't thrilled with the idea of leaving a dollar oil filter on their exotic sports car for a long time these will be perfect to trap the contaminants left in this crane case at first while we're just spinning things over and we're going to toss them straight in the garbage and keep filtering things out so we got as clean of an engine as possible before we actually fire this thing up for real Water? Yeah, there's definitely liquid. Is this water? Is this uh smell it? That's it looks water. like water. That's water, yeah. Oh look, there's water in these ones over here. Alright, we got that intake manifold off. Of course we found a little bit more sand and water. Momentarily we will have 11 quarts of Pennzoil in that pan and I've already installed a fresh oil filter. Let me know down in the comments, do you think this Viper is going to spin over or not? I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty optimistic about it. I think we're going to get this Viper running with a few dreams and some Pennzoil. So there's really only water in two of the intake ports, the ones where the valves were closed, this one and this one. It looks like there's some nasty muck in there, but something we did not do when we drained the oil pan was find out whether this water was actually salt water or not. Remember our original theory was that this was involved in a flood off the Gulf of Mexico, which is very salty. But then we saw the video along with the story of somebody hitting a fire hydrant and it falling into a sinkhole, which makes us think it was mostly flooded in fresh water. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead, we'll dip this into one of the wet intake ports here. Ugh, well it tastes like all sorts of chemicals, but I don't taste any salt on it whatsoever. Tastes, 
Tastes like clean water. As a matter of fact, oh, it's a little rusty is what it is. That's your iron, you know, that's how, where I got my free iron supplement for the day. Or is this an aluminum block? This is an aluminum block. Oh, look at that rust. I just tasted that. Make sure it gets in that drain bucket. Yeah, we got you. That's going into a very nice drain bucket. Don't You don't need to film the drain bucket, but it's definitely going in a drain bucket. Continuing the preparation to turn things over, I really want to put a lot of penetrating oil down in here so that any sort of rust buildup on the valves themselves gets kind of eaten up. What's next? We really need to clean. Look at all the sand in there. Man. Sage, what is this, Sage? What is this? I told you, take all the injectors out, Sage. I was close. I got, uh, what, 11 out of 12? Or no, 9 out of 10. relatively the same a little bit of leftover water and gunk but overall pretty nice see there's like rust in here and it's tough to see but it looks like there's gonna be rust on top of the pulleys there's sand all stuck in our tensioner pulley here so before we spin anything over by hand we're really gonna want to just get this all cleaned up so nothing's stuck that could give us the feeling that this car is kind of just stuck but I mean look at the rust on that one there and you hear this listen that one's nice we need to blow all this out as best we can another reason we want this belt off while we're testing things out here is if we get to the point where we can fire this car over well we don't want systems like our power steering pump running when there's potentially water or sand in that system We've got a lot more stuff to flush here, and you can see how long it's taken just to work on the engine side of things, but that's obviously our first priority. Last step before we try and spin this thing over by hand, I'm just gonna put a dab of ATF in the top of all the cylinders. ATF is supposedly a really good lubricant and also a good cleaner, so whatever sort of rust residue might be left in there, hopefully will get broken down as these pistons move up and down. Let's cross our fingers and for the best. All right, this is the moment we've been waiting for here. Sage, do you think it's gonna spin? Uh, I'm confident, yeah, I think so. You always say you're confident, even when you're not that confident. Oh, we're gonna find out, aren't we? All right, let's see. Yeah, there's definitely a bit of resistance, but it doesn't feel like abnormal resistance. You want a little bit. It feels nice and smooth, but let me make one Full rotation before I say anything too, too much. Yeah, man, it feels good. I mean, this is a big engine, so we're gonna need to spin this over quite a bit. But I, I'm i also now very confident, Sage. I, I like that one. Yeah, do we spend too much time not to <laughs> We really did. And so a lot of people the entire time were saying, you need to disassemble this. And mind you, I shouldn't even talk it because we haven't run it, but. The thing is, if we disassemble and do a full rebuild on this engine, we kind of know that it's going to work. And I think there is some fun in seeing whether you can revive an engine without a full rebuild. Now, a lot of the flood car guys I talked to have been extremely positive about this the entire way through, even when we thought that there was salt water in the crankcase. My friend Rebuilder guy, who's done quite a few flood rebuilds and a couple Mopars at that, he told me that we got to spin this thing <laughs> till our arms hurt because we want to get oil in the oil pumps we really want to just move everything around i mean everything in this engine is running right now just in very slow motion without any fuel or spark all right sage i'm getting tired here man i'm gonna let you take over for at least the next uh, two hours yeah that sounds fun <laughs> I'm like so excited with how well everything felt when we were spinning it over. We spun it over for like 20, 30 minutes at this point. I'm like, let's go ahead, get in the cabin of the car and actually fire it over with the fuel disconnected. 
and then I stop right there and go, wait a minute, fuel disconnected. Obviously, we're just gonna go and pull the fuel pump relay and I have yet to check out the fuse box in the engine bay here. I mean, come on. That should have been one of the first things we looked at because if you saw how much sand and water was in this car, there's likely gonna be some in here. That is if I could open it. There we go. All sandy, all dirty. Really, we don't know what all the terminals will look like in here. I think what we're gonna wanna do is just take a picture of the layout. That way, when we disassemble it all, when we take all the fuses and relays out, we know where everything goes back. We're gonna wanna clean everything as best as we can here before we try and see if the starter works. And chances are, depending on the location of the starter, it might've been waterlogged and fried too. So let's see how far we can get here. install our intake manifold I want to replace all the ignition wires and spark plugs in the Viper it'll just be good practice to eliminate one more failure point that's really cheap and inexpensive to replace now the factory wires are all numbered this is really cool on the Viper here's number 10 and then on the top of the coil packs here you can see there it says number 10 so some of them have a right angle connector some of them have a straight connector and the lengths of some of these wires are different I noticed that in the set I've ordered here so we're going to do this one at a time because our aftermarket set does not have the numbers on them so just remove one replace one until all 10 are done with our ignition wires all ran we've got the intake manifold back installed we do not have our fuel injectors installed yet but that's okay because the first time we run this car we want to do it without fuel another reason why we have our fuel relay out and sitting right here and you see that relay looks really nice and clean that's because we went and overnighted a set of all brand new relays so we shouldn't have a problem with these. The fuses themselves all look pretty good. We checked them, we cleaned everything with a wire brush that was necessary. Our only relays that are out right now are currently the fuel pump relay and the blower motor relay, just because that was the only different relay and I wasn't able to get a replacement one of those that quick. That will not matter. So with fuel and spark disconnected, all we wanna do is hit that push to start button. We wanna see if it can engage the flywheel and turn this motor over. Sage is gonna climb in the driver's seat, hit the clutch hit that button and let's hope this thing spins on its own after taking the radio trim apart here everything actually looks pretty good back here and I bet a lot of this stuff will fire up like like the push to start harness here now it's tough to actually see in there but the pins look pretty clean to me they don't look corroded this one you can see the pins a little bit better on this is the ac wiring harness here so everything looks pretty clean and yeah there's a little bit of dirt residue here but if you look at any 20 year old car behind the trim you're gonna see stuff like that i don't think this has anything to do with the flood so i'm pretty confident in both our switch and our wiring here We're not getting anything. Yeah, clutch all the way in. Yes. Yeah, nothing. No. Nothing. Nothing. No. I'm really disappointed in myself that I haven't been able to get this car fired on its own yet. We checked all the wiring that we messed with in the engine bay and checked all around. We even checked the engine ECM or ECU that is in the engine bay. And at first we thought that maybe that got waterlogged. But if you look, it's really tightly sealed. And I'm imagining that there is like a moisture barrier in there. So my fingers are crossed there's nothing wrong with it. And at this point, we've spent all of our time on the mechanical side of things, making sure our engine is in tip top shape to fire it over. 
over. Next up, we are got to go to the electrical side and find out why when we push the push to start button, nothing happens, nothing at all. Now, it could still be in a wiring harness somewhere. Obviously, you see the car still on the trailer, so we haven't had a super good look at the underside of things. And hopefully, our easiest and best case scenario is that we just have a bad starter. When I talked to my friend Rebuilder guy who is notorious for doing flood vehicles, he told me that 90% of the time in a flood vehicle, the starter is waterlogged and dead. So I have gone ahead and ordered a new starter, so we're prepared with that. But the next steps here is to get this pulled off the trailer and up on stands so that we can get under it a bit safer than here on the trailer. We can inspect everything under there. Check out our wiring. Hopefully it's something that's within reach that we can replace. So again, we can fire this car over. And the plan is once it starts, we're gonna run it for only about 30 seconds or so before we drain the fluids out and redo it again. And we're gonna see how good we can get this Viper engine to run, again, without taking everything apart. If you are excited to see this thing run, keep your fingers crossed and hit that like button. Also, if you're not already following me on Instagram where I've been posting updates to the Viper there before anything goes live here on YouTube, well, just follow me here or click that link in the description. Guys, I can't thank each and every one of you enough for watching today and I'll catch you very soon.